Thank you. Um, so it's a great pleasure to welcome you all back to the final day of the conference and also to introduce uh, one of the um, founding scoundrels, I guess one can call her, uh, as part of the collective that was working in uh, the mid around 2004, 2005 to conceptualize an urban hub at ACC. And Sue has been absolutely central to both the intellectual vision of ACC and most importantly, knowing how the global academic funding system works to ensure that we are able to do the kind of work that we do. And, um, and apart from that, of course, as all of you know, Sue is unbelievably prolific and productive, and in that sense has also set an incredibly high bar for everyone in the center to kind of feel, you know, um, even if you do do what you're required to do, that you're not a slacker. So, um, so yeah, and Sue does this, you know, with a generosity and an inclusiveness that really, I think, um, explains a lot about the character and the culture in ACC. So it's a really fantastic pleasure to ask Sue to chair the session and to welcome her this morning, and she'll introduce the panelists. Thank you, and um, before I get to introducing the panelists, um, I, I think it's important to introduce the panel and the idea of what we were hoping to get to in the panel. You, you might remember, and it may have washed over you in that very first day when we were talking about the history of the African Center for Cities, that it started its, um, its life as Cities in Africa. And the acronym for that is? And so it was changed. <laughs> and it, it, but what is really important is that we then had not just a, a more literate discussion about um, what you might call a center, but why you might call it an African center for cities rather than cities in Africa. And what we were hoping to achieve, I think, in that, and what I think has been so extraordinary about our celebration of engagement of, over the last few days, was this idea that you would have an African view on the urban question. It would be an African center for cities, not a center for African cities. And I think that's what we have around, and one of the nicest things has been to see people talking about St. Petersburg and a range of other cities, as well as interrogating the African question. And doing so across a series of scales that go from the very particular right up to the global. And in ways that cover a set of registers from the artistic through to the literary, the theoretical, mathematical, and uh, much more conventional questions of political economy, and of course those questions of scale. And to do so requires extraordinary human beings who are able to be either really good at what they do and to share that with others who do something different to create a dialogue across it. And then over and above that, what you really do need is some people who are able to either synthesize or to provide leadership that draws those things together. Now, they can't all operate in the same kinds of spaces, and some of them will end up being intellectual leaders, and we have some of those global intellectual urban thought uh, makers in the room in a very academic, scholarly sense. But some of the people who, when we look back on this period of mass urbanization, of rapid urbanization, in the early 20th century are able to straddle quite extraordinarily a set of political and policy engagements that demands not just a big brain, but also a very particular kind of dis political disposition, personal disposition, professional disposition, and to be frank, also an enormous energy. <laughs> and <laughs> it's appropriate therefore that we are here on a Saturday morning at nine o'clock <laughs> with three of the most energetic, engaged, and dare I say it, also interesting and entertaining uh, people to lead us into the discussion uh, about the urban policy questions of the day. Now, we're gonna talk very largely at the global scale and the importance of inserting 
into some of the sort of bigger macro kinds of questions that go beyond a particular city. But I want to tell you that if you have any questions about the integrity and the authority on which our speakers uh, will engage us this morning, each of them has a credibility that has deep roots and local resonances as well. Um, and so it's an enormous privilege for me to be able to uh, introduce you to three people, two of whom I know well, and one of whom I know enormously well by reputation. Um, so I dare not say how many decades Mark and I have known each other, but um, you can look at the gray in his beard rather than the gray in my hair. Um, <laughs> and he, Mark will kick us off. Um, Mark is, is a local. He's not a UCT boy. He's over at Stellenbosch and the Sustainability Institute and has a distinguished chair there um, looking at complex systems and has been a catalytic force in provoking, in disturbing, in pushing for alternative perspectives on the urban question. And he will begin our, our, our discussion with some of the work that he's been doing for UNEP um, and why that is important. We debated who would go first and why they would go first. There's an argument from starting with the most macro questions and going slightly down or the other way around. We went with that as the rationale. Some of you in the conference will have already heard from Arama Revi over on the end, um, who I've had the most enormous privilege of, of getting to know over the last decade. Arama has many uh, attributes and you can read them all in the handbook, which you have in front of you, and I would encourage you to do that. But what they don't do justice to is his ability not just to catalyze probably one of the most important educational initiatives in the, in the world, I think, to initiate, drive, uh, and establish the Indian Institute for Human Settlements, which we've heard a lot about, but at the same time, <laughs> to engage in the global process um, and to lead and drive uh, and corral the people who uh, perhaps somewhat surprisingly were able to generate the sustainable development goal. That's not what he's gonna talk to us about, actually. He's gonna talk to us about another of the hats that he is involved with, which is the IPCC process. Um, and then we'll turn to Carlos. Um, Carlos, I have to say, it. This is the first time I've been in this building. Have you been here before, to this building? You have. Okay, I've worked at UCT for 21 years. Carlos is a, is a UCT um, person at the Graduate School of Business and is better connected than I am. What can I say? He's been in the building before. Um, and, and for UCT, that is just an immense privilege. And, and so as a colleague, I, I, and, and I'm claiming it and I'm highlighting it, um, you will see from uh, his profile that he is so, so much more than that. Um, recently, just come back from uh, a significant leadership role in the African community, continues to be the most significant advisor um, on matters of state at the national and the uh, local level. Carlos is also a visiting scholar at the James Martin School at Oxford. Um, so a man who has the academic credentials, the policy credentials, and perhaps Africa's foremost thought leader. So we've got an extraordinary panel uh, before us. So let's give them the floor, um, and we'll see how we go on their presentations. I am going to nudge them when they ramble. Um, and so that we have enough time for dialogue. Um, but I think you will agree we are immensely privileged. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sue. And uh, Edgar, and thanks for <coughs> the, the invitation to cross borders and <laughs> leave the territory of Bitcoin, as they call us, in Stellenbosch, <laughs> and, um, and come to the citadel on the mountain. Um, yeah, what I'm going to talk about is uh, a report that will be launched at the Resilience Conference on the Re Resilient Cities Conference in Bonn in a few months, called "The Weight of Cities." Now, this is a play on the famous hagiography of Norman Fraser, which is, "How much does your building weigh, Mr. Foster?" <laughs> 
and it might be worth pausing to, to try and remember who asked Norman Foster this question. Yeah? Anybody? Buckminster Fuller. And so really it's a play on that to kind of start thinking about uh, cities, urban infrastructures, buildings in a systemic way from the point of view of the methodology that infuses the work of the International Resource Panel, which was set up in 2009 in order to address the challenge at the end of the fourth assessment report of the IPCC, which was, if we want a sustainable world, we need a sustainable economy. How do we restructure the global economy uh, from a resource point of view? And uh, the IRP was set up, and I've been a member ever since. <clears throat> and I coordinate the city's working group um, of this, and we re reproduced our first report in 2013, which really set up a framework of thinking that says we can't think about urban metabolism without infrastructure, and we can't think about infrastructure without urban metabolism. We need to think of the two together, and obviously that set up the challenge of, well, actually, how do we do that in practice? So this report really is the first report that attempts to answer a very difficult question, which is what are the resource requirements of future urbanization? So if UN statistics are correct, that uh, we could expect the urban population to double between in the 40 years, 2010 to 2050, what are the resource implications of that? And that question was really triggered by a figure that I read uh, in, 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 a, in a book by Vaclav Smil um, uh, called, called something like The Making of the Material World, where he, where he refers to the fact that China used more cement in the three years 2011 to 2013 than the United States used in the whole of the 20th century. So if that, if that one figure really focuses the mind and says, okay, there's still quite a couple of hundred million people to go, I mean, 800 million to go in Africa, uh, how many in, in India and in China and all over the world, you know, if, 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 if the definition of what it means to arrive, to be modern, to be middle class, is to live in cement, which seems to be our current urban psychosis, where's this resource going to come from? Uh, especially in light of the fact that you need to heat the lime up to 2,000 degrees centigrade to make the cement, which in turn requires energy, which in turn has climate impl implications. So th that's just one example to kind of focus the mind on the question, what are the resource requirements of future urbanization if the urban population is expected to, to double? In order to do that, I put together a team from various parts of the world uh, Obviously, a whole bunch of them, number crunchers and modelers. Uh, and we ended up focusing on uh, building a baseline which estimated that, the current, that in 2010, the total amount of resources flowing through urban systems globally was 40 billion tons per annum. And that if we continue to design and operate urban systems on a business as usual basis, and if we actually do start to uh, eliminate urban poverty, that will go up to 90 billion tons, which is greater than the total amount of resources we actually currently consume. So it's obvious that from a resource point of view, business, doing cities business as usual is gonna blow the fuses of the planet and we have to rethink. How do we rethink that? Well, we obviously got to rethink all our infrastructure systems, but we focused on three for the sake of the argument. We looked at district energy systems, mobility and water, and the criteria that we looked at was climate impacts, water impacts, metals impacts, and land impacts. And using life cycle analysis of about 80 cities around the world, we came to the conclusion that just from a resource point of view in those particular sectors, there is the potential for resource efficiency of between 36 and 54 percent. And then on the basis of that, triangulated that around a scenario which says, uh, a 50% uh, improvement in resource productivity, uh, or if you like another way of saying that, a 50% reduction in total resource consumption per annum is possible to think about. But it actually does require quite fundamental restructuring of urban infrastructures on a global basis. But we didn't just look at infrastructures and resources, we also looked at space and focused on densification. 
And like many these days, we critique the notion of average, of, of thinking about densities from the point of average densities, and rather focused on, uh, on strategic intensification. And obviously, I worked very, very closely with Serge Salat, who's, who's such a great thinker about this, this whole challenge of, of gentrification. But from the perspective of strategic intensification, of a hierarchy of, of, of nodes, of high density nodes within your urban system, interconnected with efficient and affordable mobility systems. And if you put that together with uh, conceptions of the neighborhood, five to, five to eight stories high, 80 to 100 inter street intersections, um, um, 18 kilometers of street, street length per square kilometer, those kinds of uh, matrix, matrices, you start being able to develop an image of a possibility of new kinds of infrastructures in higher density formations. So we build a whole framework around that, uh, which is kind of, in many ways, the usual United, Station, United Nations, UNEP, whatever it's called now, United Nations Environment, um, uh, way of thinking, very technocratic, very data-driven, uh, kind of uh, putting up the big scare numbers in order to s say what are the right things that need to be done. Okay, so that was the framework. But the second part of the report breaks away from that model and says we need to think about governance. And we kind of put up a framework for periodizing the evolution of urban governance, the paradigms that governed, uh, or that framed the way we think about urban, go urban governance over the last century focusing in particular on the traditional Weberian model of the centralized bureaucracy managing the centralized uh, um, infrastructure networks and how that then broke down into the neoliberal framework um, of, of, of splintered urbanism uh, in the 80s and 90s. And then we asked the question, well, what is the mode of urban governance that is appropriate for the kinds of changes that we need to be considering now? I mean, the, the Weberian model was really officials, officials and politicians presiding over society and setting regulatory frameworks. The neoliberal mode was partnerships between state and the private sector with the domination of, 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 of the property industry. And what we argue is that there's an, there's, we think emerging around the world is an alternative mode of governance, which is really an alliance between uh, social enterprises, innovators, venture capitalists, officials, um, uh, visionary politicians, a whole new, if you like, knowledge-based or knowledge innovation-based conception of governance that's emerging. And we call that entrepreneurial governance, uh, hoping that we can kind of extract the notion of entrepreneurialism from its neoliberal um, connotations to really to connote the, 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 the notion of um, uh, innovation-driven type thinking. We then kind of review the thousands of initiatives around the world that are uh, experimenting, and we start to, th to, to, to think about a definition of, 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 of experimentation, which is influenced by Edgar and Malik's book, but also draws on the, the book, The Experimental City, which talks about experimentation as an inclusive, practice-based, and challenge-led initiative designed to promote system innovation through social learning under conditions of deep uncertainty and ambiguity. If you put this notion of experimentation together with the notion of entrepreneurial governance, we think you start to be able to <clears throat> um, conceptualize a way of thinking about urban governance that may be up to the task. A one-size-fits-all is not going to do the trick, given uh, uh, um, uh, contextual diversity. But in order to be able to think like that, we argue that we're going to have to, or I would argue now, going a bit beyond the report, <clears throat> we're going to have to go beyond what uh, Roberta Unger calls structure fetishism. The obsession with the notion that structure and a change in structure is all that matters. Because that kind of way of thinking obscures the kind of incrementalism that we call for in this report. And I want to end off with a quote from Unger, which is, structure fetishism denies our power to change the quality as well as the content of our practices and institutions, the way in which we relate to our structure-defying and structure-changing freedom. Structure fetishism 
finds expression and defense in an idea hallowed in the history of social thought that imposes, that opposes interludes of effervescence, charisma, mobilization, and energy to the ordinary reign of institutionalized routine. When half asleep, we continue to act out the script written in the creative intervals. Structure fetishism represents an unwarranted denial of our power to change society and therefore ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try and pick up from where Mark left off. Of course, um, I'm not going to speak necessarily about the IPCC. There are lots of other colleagues from the IPCC here, but more about what some of these global processes mean in, in the connection with everyday life. Because, you know, there's these fancy things that happen way out there, evidently. And I guess the question that many of us have is, how does that connect to the everyday, everyday life and, you know, living in uh, an informal settlement or a township in Cape Town or uh, Sao Paulo or Mumbai or whatever it is? And in fact, is there a connection at all between these fancy things that we go and negotiate at the United Nations or something that's running on a supercomputer in some place, uh, a model, or the kind of work that Mark and I you know, do a little bit of? And I think you know, over the last couple of days, Cape Town is such a real example of that coming together. Um, there are parts of the city which I believe were, or, or the region that were cut off as far as water supply were concerned. So if I look back three years ago, or two and a half years ago, and I came and spoke here, not in this building, but another building, I wouldn't have imagined that we'd be seeing a, you know, a large million plus city uh, actually facing a very serious crisis as far as water is concerned. Because it's sort of not conceived that mega cities or even million cities uh, in, in the modern world uh, can be exposed to existential crises like this. And crises that don't sort of emerge from the immediate location, but are teleconnected, not only here in the subcontinent, but on something that happened a long time ago in another place. And I think that's, that's the interesting thing that we have to sort of uh, en engage with. The idea of the everyday life and you know, all the struggles that many people here are involved in, whether it's on housing or basic services and you know, livelihoods and stuff like that, how does that really connect with these larger processes? And I think you know, part of the answer is in, in, in some of the numbers that, that Mark gave us. Uh, we're living in a world which is now really, really full of people. Uh, and unfortunately, some of those people consume a lot of resources, including people like us. Uh, and eventually, those resources are concentrating in the biosphere, uh, and they're coming back to bite us. So the challenge, I guess, is it's not only a question of local governance, but to address the Cape Town question or desiccation in un many parts of the world, you have to address the question of the global commons. Uh, and you know, you know, even if you look at it theoretically, you have to have a governance framework to deal with that. And frankly, we don't have a governance framework to deal with either uh, the global commons that connect the biosphere, the atmosphere system, the oceans, et cetera, et cetera, and the global financial system, which in a sense is one of the key drivers of structural change in this process. So I guess, you know, in an ideal world, you would have a governance frame where you could engage, there would be politics, and there would be feedback from an event like this that don't only, and it's not only heard in Davos, but it's heard in various other places. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that. So we have to work with a very imperfect system at the current point of time. Uh, and part of that imperfect system is the United Nations. It's a club of a whole range of countries. They talk about some things, uh, and they've managed to corral a whole range of scientists from across the world to work for free in some senses, uh, to try and understand what these, what, what these processes are about. Uh, but I guess one of the core questions there is, what is the role that cities actually play in this process? Still relatively recently, and you know, there's uh, an old friend and colleague in, uh, in, in the last IPCC cycle, we, for the first time, we actually had a set of chapters that looked at cities uh, and, and, and settlements. So over the process starting in the early 1990s, it took almost I would say 20 years uh, for the climate science community, which is fairly inward looking in some senses, and I come from that, I'm sort of a uh, lapse modeler, to recognize that place uh, and settlements, and of course cities, have an important role in this process. 
And in fact, the biggest challenge, and I remember this, you know, when we opened the conference in, in whatever, in, in, in Japan a long time back, we said, the climate models at the moment are incapable with even the fantastic science competition that we have of actually representing and picking up cities. Cities don't exist because the climate models work at a 100 by 100 kilometer or 50 by 50 kilometer scale. And the kind of processes that you see in Cape Town or any other city in the world are impossible to capture. So they capture in the aggregate. But in actual fact, the key driver, not only of the climate challenge and a whole range of other global environmental challenges, but the opportunities of employment and productivity and the, you know, and the global economy sit in urban regions. So in some senses, cities do a couple of very remarkable things. The reason that many of us you know, are in them and are scholars and work with them is they concentrate opportunity. They concentrate opportunity of actually you know, enabling employment, of, of creating wealth. But what we often forget is that cities also concentrate three other things which are actually very deadly. They concentrate risk, and that's what, you know, what's happening here. They concentrate poverty in many parts of the world, especially in ours. Uh, and they concentrate conflict because of inequality. And I think that's the very, the, you know, the critical question that intergovernmental processes are really not able to connect the dots on. So you have the great potential and the great opportunity, but the risks that, comes, that come with this form of, of urbanization is so dramatic that we actually don't have a calculus to try and address uh, and, and, and engage with this question. So I think what, what we are starting to struggle with at the current point of time, within the IPCC and, and otherwise, is how do you sit uh, the urban question within the larger frame? And I'll, and I'll try and sort of construct for you at least two or three ideas of how you could think about that. The first thing, of course, that sits within the urban frame, which is not, uh, you know, in other things, is the question of, of human behavior both in social and individual terms. So there is this network of relations, which is a black box in, in most models, which talks about how people consume, uh, you know, how conflict is managed, how solidarity is built, et cetera, et cetera. We don't know how to model that, but we know that the everyday life of cities is about the negotiation around that question. So if I look at this as sort of three interconnected kind of, of, of spheres, and then there's uh, the emergent behavior of cities, which we have actually a uh, very, very limited understanding of. We know that there are systems of systems. Uh, Mark has described some of them, but we know that there are a whole range of processes that they don't understand. And then finally, that's connected with uh, in the biosphere and a whole range of global resources in which there's continuous sets of feedback. So one of the core challenges that we're trying to deal with just now is to try and understand how we can intervene in these processes to actually enable a change in structure at each of these levels. In, in, in very, let, me, let, me, let me come uh, to sort of very, very um, sort of uh, concrete terms. So um, in, in the city of Bangalore that you know, we, we live in, there's a very serious challenge of water. It sits on a plateau like Johannesburg. Uh, so water has to be pumped up. It's not near a, a river or sea. So effectively, it has no more water left. It's growing dramatically. It's a, it's a million city. You know, it's grown from about 5 million to 10, 10 million, et cetera, et cetera. But you cannot actually enable that city to become more inclusive, more productive, to become whatever it is uh, that, 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 that the citizens and, and India wants to make it without addressing questions of urban structure and urban inequality. If you don't bring in questions of, uh, of land use and planning, if you don't bring in questions of how the transportation systems actually work, if you don't bring in questions of how the governance frame uh, and the fiscal and the intergovernmental frame actually uh, sort of how, how, how they connect to each other. So what I'm saying is the climate question and the question of urban sustainability are critically related to our reimagining uh, not only how the urban metabolism works and what it works for and how inequality and access is actually maintained, but also how that connects with our ideas of how development will work itself out and what options we have to deal with. And I'll close with you know, a few things which people may not necessarily know. So the big push that we have just now in the climate space is to try and see after the Paris Climate Accord whether we can reach 1.5 degrees centigrade. We're currently at about one above pre-industrial levels. Uh, and why is that so? That's because many LDCs, many countries which are relatively poor and very often in semi-arid regions, and most of the small income, uh, small island development states are actually going to go under in, in very serious ways. Of course, all of that driven by, by the urbanization we're seeing in, 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 in other places. The challenge is 
that we cannot make the 1.5 degree target without absolutely dramatic changes in the single largest industry that we have in, in the contemporary world. And that is called the fossil fuel industry. So this transition we're talking about is, is a complete upending of the single largest industry in which some of the largest countries in the world are deeply invested. When you look at countries towards the north, like Russia or Saudi Arabia or other, other, uh, uh, other locations, their economy, their structure, and their cities are critically dependent on how these fossil fuels are organized. So if you hear Al Gore talking, you know, he shows you these fantastic and challenging uh, images of the world coming, coming apart and then says, look, we've got these wonderful things that can solve this. Photovoltaics, uh, energy efficiency, and to some extent, resource efficiency. Actually, when we look at the numbers, we find two things, and I'll close with that. The first thing is that all of this wonderful turnover that we are seeing just now to renewables is actually not going to enable us to get 1.5. So we're potentially going to have an overrun, an overshoot that could well take us to two degrees. We're at one at the moment, think of where Cape Town is at the moment, to two degrees, and that overshoot may not last one season or two years or five years. It, might, it may actually last 20 or 30 years. We don't actually know how it will work itself out. What that means is we have to engage and enable a whole range of dramatic new uh, technical measures, which of course means social measures, which, are, which have got to do with land and territory. Uh, afforestation, what we call ne negative emission technologies. And if that doesn't work, then we will have to go potentially, or some people will want us to go, into absolutely imaginable, uh, unimaginable territory. That's called geoengineering, actually interfering with, with the atmosphere. So these are hard choices. And what we do in our, in our urban systems will give us the opportunity to turn them around or actually continue in a rather sort of bleak uh, possibility where what's happening at, at Cape Town, uh, day zero will be happening in hundreds of places uh, across the world. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. Just a week ago, I was in Addis Ababa participating in the last uh, African Union summit. And it was a very interesting moment. Uh, I'm a member of the AU reform team because during the summit, the discussions were around three very important outcomes of a discussion that has been long in the continent. One was the free circulation of people and the adoption of what is called the African passport, which is basically a visa regime and the possibility of much wider possibilities of circulation uh, within Africa. Uh, the Open Skies Agreement that uh, basically has a number of countries, 23 right now, opening completely their uh, space for uh, air travel within Africa in the most liberalized conditions, which basically facilitates and increase the possibility of connectivity. And then the third, the adoption of the continental free trade area, which will create a single market in the continent, and the agreement is going to be signed in a special summit in March, but the negotiations are finished, and there is very strong support uh, for such an undertaking that is going to change completely the relationship between Africa and the rest of the world. Now, you can see these three big takes from a summit uh, demonstrate a resolve and assertiveness that was not there before. What happened? Well, basically in 2013, when the OAU-AU completed 50 years of existence, a lot of people were concerned about how we are going to organize our party. It was a celebration. Uh, this is a jubilee celebration. And instead, a few people decided that this was not the moment necessarily for celebration, although you have to claim success in a certain number of areas, including liberating the continent from colonialism and apartheid. The biggest problems of the continent are still there. So we need to rather focus on what has not been done and try to see how in the next 50 years we actually change that uh, perspective and we try to be much more focused on what kind of transformations the continent requires. And this is how the Agenda 2063 was born. It was born of this uh, moment, uh, symbolically, where you have to pause for reflection, 
And there was an interactive discussion with heads of state and leaders. I was the moderator of that discussion in Addis, where for five hours, there was a very interesting interaction about the things that don't work. And amongst the things that didn't work, uh, identified then, you have these three takes that I just mentioned to you. So there is an acceleration, no doubt, about how the continent is getting organized. And there is an AU reform in process that has the ambition of funding the organization, amongst other things, with the money from Africa. Because right now, believe it or not, the African Union depends for 75% from external support. And this means, basically, you don't call the tune. You, you depend on what others' priorities are. And others' priorities include, of course, how you deal with your economics, deal with your uh, partnerships, how you deal with your urban agenda. And it's no surprise that when you know, the new urban agenda was adopted, some of the specificities of Africa were not there. And they were not there for a reason, because we're still very weak in terms of negotiating capacity. I'll give you the example of the global discussions. When the MDGs were established, it was basically a, a, a get together of uh, statisticians and economists at the UN, uh, OECD, IMF, and World Bank level that agreed in a certain way of measuring poverty. And from that work derived a number of very important targets and indicators that were important to follow. And that's how the MDGs were put together. They were put together with a concept that you have global targets and then you just, you know, uh, imply that the same targets are valid at the national level. But this is obviously an absurdity. You cannot have, like, MDG number one, reducing poverty by half as a global target and as a national target, because obviously a country that has 8% poverty has to reduce by four, and another country that has 80% poverty has reduced by 40% in the same time horizon. This is obviously something that historically you just need to be familiar with the literature, doesn't make any sense. But this is what was adopted, and everybody kind of clapped. And it's like you know having a marathonist running with the sprinter and wanting the same result. Now, you have with the SDGs something that tries to correct this in the most horrible possible way. Also doesn't make any sense. I'll give you an example. You know, if you read the Bible or the Quran, you will have the same targets as the SDGs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you are going to finish with poverty, you are going to finish with disease, you are going to finish with everything in 15 years. So we are doing better than the Pope. And um, I think it's really something that creates a level of expectations that then it's very impossible to meet. And obviously, it's compounded by the fact that you have such an array of targets. It's about everything. It's, it's a shopping list, as we used to call that it becomes very difficult to actually distinguish what is a priority. So the tendency would be for the international players, including the UN agencies and the international institutions, to kind of adopt one of the targets. And then they become you know, quite familiar with that one. They track that one in complete isolation from the rest. And this has been part of the difficulties that we have had, particularly if you are in Africa and you have this level of expectation uh, it is not very surprising that when we actually domesticate that discussion, we try to make it an African discussion, we kind of reproduce the same pattern of behavior. So Agenda 2063 became also hostage of the same difficulty of having a very big ambition, uh, aspirational, and not very practical. So we need to kind of ground this discussion and make sure that not only it is grounded, but we understand one specificity that is the most important for the policy discussion, which is coherence. And coherence, you cannot be attained with the sectoral approaches of the past. We need now to have a number of priorities that are really the ones that are going to make transformation possible, and then make sure that the various dimensions are included in that target. Thank you.
I'm very keen to leave our panelists an opportunity to respond to each other. Can we take two, maybe three very brief comments, interventions from the floor, and then I'm going to pass back to them. One, two, and at the back. That's three men. Can we see if there is a woman? <laughs> no woman? No woman? Okay, we'll live with our three white men. Thank you. Seeing as... <laughs> Uh, apologies for being a, a white man. It's hard to change this color of your skin. Um, or your gender is maybe or your easier. Gender, oh, that might be higher. <laughs> um, thanks very much for three fascinating contributions. A very quick question to Mark. You talked about structural fetishism, but you also offered a vision of the built environment, which sounded, sounded pretty much like a blueprint. How do you build this model of the built environment, which I completely agree with, but how do you build that incrementally? is the first question. And secondly, what are the social consequences of this relatively costly form of development? That's always been the objection, that, that this will exclude the poor. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Andrea Rigon from the Bartlett Development Planning Unit. Just a quick one. You talk about consumptions and the level of consumption that we have, but also as a community. Sometimes when I see my life, my colleagues' life as professionals, our level of ecological footprint, not to even talk about the carbon footprint, is 50, 60 times more our fair share. So in a way, I, I found it difficult to have into this conversation. And in a way, it's a discourse that I found it a bit absent in our conversation about the world, the fact that we really radically need to change how we operate, how we live, and, and that. And I, I found it a deep personal hypocrisy, so I would like to know how you deal with that. Thank you. And at the back. I feel very on the spot as a white male. Um, <laughs> and I hope the next round is all uh, females. Um, Thank you for the insights, they were wonderful. Uh, Arama, I just wanted a clarifi clarification about why uh, our wonderful renewable energy will not be able to get, be able to get us there. Is this vested interests? Uh, is there uh, something more? Um, and then Carlos, uh, the African passport, continental free trade area, and uh, free airline movement sounds very aspirational, and you're saying that this might be adopted in March? I mean, this is amazing. Is, is that likely? Um, could we have some clarification? Thank you. Some lovely points and interventions. Can you pick up on them, not necessarily directly, but as you also respond to each other, um, and again, with relative brevity, trying to highlight these very real tensions uh, that Marcus was pointing to on kind of, we need global governance, we don't want structural fetishism, we have an absolute imperative from the African community to engage in new and different ways in a system that doesn't work for us. But at the same time, we are interconnected, and the cities are absolutely central to that. Can you just perhaps have a last word each? Thanks. On the, <clears throat> on the challenge of how do we do it, one very quick response is it's already happening. So I think there is um, an unfinished or, yeah, I think unfinished task of trying to document the literally thousands of experiments happening around the world and trying to understand in a, uh, the possibility that there's a kind of DNA, there's a kind of dynamic at work that is resulting in re responsive changes across many different kinds of regions, which seem to have very similar characteristics. Uh, and I think if we could, we, if, if somehow we could think about how we tackle that empirical task, we might be able to think of how you accelerate uh, those, that incremental process. I was part of doing something on global civil society uh, 15 years ago with Johns Hopkins. It, it, there are ways I think we could do this through a massive global collaborative research initiative uh, that could, could really be instructive, I think. Uh, and obviously we must tackle the, 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 the exclusion-inclusion issue, which is where the African city becomes so interesting. Uh, because in many ways in African cities we haven't really sunk in concrete the technologies of the, of the 19th and the 20th century. We have choices to be made. And I've got a research group that is uh, starting to tackle the question of what are the political, urban political implications of the global energy revolution that's resulting in the construction 
of decentralized energy infrastructures in space economies that previously were just on the periphery and not really significant strategically. What, is, what are the urban political implications of those dynamics? And in particular in the African context where we still have to make some of the big decisions on the kind of infrastructure technologies that we uh, can, can implement. So I think the, 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 that does, I think, go to the, the personal, where we are personally in the, in the dynamics of change. And uh, I, w I woke up this morning in a Nika village that I was involved in building and walked around and saw people of different classes, different colors, and I think we all need to face up to breaking out of our traditional urban systems and building alternatives, concretely, not just talking about them. So let's go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, I'll, I'll pick two issues. Uh, aspirational, uh, yes, well, part of the Agenda 2063 is very uh, aspirational like, for instance, silencing of the guns by 2020, uh, which will be difficult. But these ones that I just mentioned are a bit more concrete in this sense. They are not really requiring that the 50, 50, 55 countries move at the same time, but rather, you know, the ones that are ready start. For the open skies, it's 23 countries. For the uh, the continental free trade area, you have 45 countries, and for uh, the African passport, you have 20 countries that are already there. Uh, so you kind of move with the agents of change. You move with the ones that are ready, and then the others have to, you know, complement uh, some of their policy changes to, to get to, to the same point. And I think it's very important because it really sets the trend and creates opportunities that are going to make sure that others also jump in. Um, and part of these transformations are important because we are in a process of structural transformation in the continent. Uh, and this process of structural transformation requires, amongst others, industrialization. And amongst others, it has to live with the uh, rapid urbanization and rapid population growth. When you mix this together, uh, you could be uh, scared of what Aro just said about uh, energy. But a latecomer has also some advantages. Latecomers leapfrog. They don't need to go the same route as everybody else. They can go and just take the latest technology, which is cleaner. They can also now appropriate renewable energy potential because the costs of actually using it are matching fossil fuels. So you don't need to go the fossil fuels route. Even the fact that Africa has so much fossil fuels for exports is an advantage. The fact that we don't refine as much was obviously an indication of some fragility in our economies. But now it can be turned into an advantage because these fossil fuels, the fact that they were not refined, if you are going to use them for the growth of the continent, you will have to go a route that is probably more expensive than just going renewables. Um, so I think um, uh, Africa, in many megatrends, can position itself for a latecomer's advantage. And we can elaborate on that in the discussion, if you want. Thanks, Carlos. I'll pick up on, on, on that note. I mean, the great advantages to being, being, being a latecomer, and you can absolutely leapfrog. Uh, the interesting, the big latecomer, of course, are cities. Uh, so, you know, at, at one end, like I said, the negative side of that is the cities could be the largest and most, most significant stranded asset that you have. I mean, if you look 70 years ahead, and if water becomes a real issue for Cape Town, I guess the rhetorical question is, would you move Cape Town? <laughs> and that's, that's, not a, that's not a trivial question. 15 years ago, I, we asked this question when we were doing long-term planning for Shanghai and for northern, uh, northern Netherlands. And if you look at the Northern Netherlands, in some senses, because of what's going to happen in the North Sea, one of the questions is bring down the dikes. Because you can't actually maintain that system uh, with the kind of structural barriers that you'd like to maintain. And then, of course, you go back to a very different idea of the Netherlands. But uh, I, I just sort of... <laughs> He's not advocating influx control for Cape Town. <laughs> no, I'm not. 
but to, 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 to sort of build on what, what Carlos was saying. So there's tremendous amount of innovation happening in various places, and cities are, you know, the, sort of the incubators of a lot of that, of that innovation. But I think one of the deep structural challenges is in our imagination of how governance actually works itself out. And the big fight, to my mind, that will happen, and it's happening now over the next 15 or 20 years, is uh, to sort of reimagine the relationship between the nation state and, and local processes. Uh, and that imagination currently is structured on the idea of, not of subsidiarity, but that local governments and local processes are just there to implement this crazy top-down agenda, which comes from various biblical and UN kind of processes. Uh, but in actual fact, when, when, when agency emerges at the lower level, then you find a lot of messiness, uh, and you find a lot of incrementalism, and we actually don't know how to box that. And I think part of what one's seeing in this, in this conference is really how does one engage with those processes, catalyze them, use those forms of knowledges, uh, and enable really rapid learning uh, through different uh, kinds of, um, of, of, of environments. But the real political battle really is about where the agency lies uh, and how we can build a partnership with multiple levels of governance, uh, all the way from the local uh, to the global. And I think, you know, this is an unfinished agenda. The new urban agenda is a laundry list. It does not embrace these questions because these battles will be fought within the political and social cultures of different regions, forget about different countries. Uh, but we have to sum it in a way that actually leads to, uh, I think, a very different set of alternatives because it is what I've learned over the last 20 or 30 years is if we had done the stuff that we were talking about to answer the question of renewables at the time of Rio, we had the option of doing them one by one. The reason why the SDGs are relatively important, in, in, in spite of the fact they're very confused and they've got lots of things happening there, is because now we have to do all of them together because the consequences for hundreds of millions of people who are the most vulnerable are extremely high if we don't. We've lost that window of opportunity. So it means that we really have to think about radical innovation uh, in terms of you know, consumption, in terms of what we behave, how we actually work. Uh, and also in the institutional structures that we work with. So we don't actually have a choice. Or other people are going to pay the price for it, uh, at least in the, you know, th those who, who normally take the burden. Thank you. Um, we've had amazing inputs from people. We've had some very clear questions. I think we have time for one or two more. May I remind uh, people in the room that you have rights as well as responsibilities when it comes to demanding uh, profile and presence. And uh, so those of you who are not white men, that's the reminder and the prompt, if there is anything um, that you would like to add and say, please do so um, as we begin to draw this to a close. Um, we've had extraordinary provocations. I'm not sure we've got a lot more time. Is anybody else, anybody else who would like to add anything? You mean you don't want to change the Quran, the Bible, and the SDGs? <laughs> um, folks, thank you so much. Uh, with that, um, can I just uh, encourage us to continue the conversation as cities as latecomers? Uh, what might we innovate? What do we want? How do we insert into that global process in ways that ensure that the African voice is there and present? I'm just going to hand back to Edgar. Thanks, sir. So, two very practical things. One is today's lunch is not what we had the last two days. You'll have a packed lunch. It's a grab a box, and you can enjoy the outside air. Um, it is very beautifully done, and it will be as delicious. And then um, we've got a rap party tonight, not as in hip hop, but as in end of conference, um, 19, at uh, half past seven. And it will be a cash bar, so it's for own account. And uh, we're encouraging you to have dinner first somewhere in the city, and then join us there at any point in, in the evening. And it is a, it's, everyone knows where it is. It's in the program, in the map folder of your program. So do come through tonight. It's in a little dive spot uh, in the middle of all the wealth of the waterfront. Um, but it is not that, we promise you. Uh, it is pretty seedy. So do uh, come and, you know, bring your, bring your party on. Thank you, and thanks again to the panel. Okay.